today on Call Out. Heavy fog hinders Parks Canada's efforts to rescue an injured hiker off the West Coast Trail. So we may get turned back. Uh, in this case, we don't have a backup plan other than waiting it out. And later, sinking ships and bathtub flips keep the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary on the move. Simulator team, your instructor. Victoria Coast Guard Radio, this is Auxiliary. Wednesday, 10.30 a.m., Port Renfrew, British Columbia. Parks Canada rescue specialists Shannon Dixon and Jeff Caro arrive at a local sports field. A helicopter is inbound to help them evacuate a hiker from the West Coast Trail. We're going to pick up uh, Kathy DeWolf. Uh, she's an injured party, uh, left knee injury, overuse. Kathy DeWolf from Alberta is unable to continue the grueling six day, 75 kilometer hike. She and her hiking partner are at Sequana Cabin, about 40 kilometers north of Port Renfrew. Local First Nations trail workers are assisting the couple and in radio contact with the rescue team. It's sunny here, but very foggy on the coast. And there are large ocean swells making a beach landing by boat too dangerous. There's no guarantee that it will be clear enough for the helicopter to land at the extraction point on the trail. So we may get turned back. Uh, in this case, we don't have a backup plan other than waiting it out. We're going to be limited by fog in this machine. These guys really know the coast. This guy in particular is our, uh, our best trained rescue pilot, and he could probably get us in there somehow. So we'll see how it goes. Jeff and Shannon are part of a five-member team of Parks Canada rescue specialists who live and work out of their station in Port Renfrew at the south end of the West Coast Trail. They rescue by boat, helicopter, and on foot. Today, it's a helicopter, but Jeff has given his seat to Dave Jensen, an Australian Ranger team leader, here to exchange life-saving skills with his Canadian counterparts. The flight to the extraction point at Sequana Cabin will take about 20 minutes. It's like skydiving, isn't it? While the Australian Ranger doesn't have to worry about great white sharks or crocodiles in BC waters, the rugged coastline and frigid ocean temperatures have their own set of hazards to train for. He's practiced rescue techniques with a few of the First Nations trail guardians who maintain the trails and learned how to beach the tender in large swells. This one is gonna go mid-thigh. Learning how to load a prone subject into the rib by rolling them over the gunnels is a useful skill in any part of the world. One, one, five here. Go ahead, six, six. The helicopter approaches Sequana Cabin flies in low for a landing on the beach. Probably gonna do a full assessment here and look at it, if you don't mind. No. We've got trail guardians that represent each of the three different First Nations bands that the trail travels through. They do some interpretation of, of you know, the importance of those areas to their ancestors and to their, their own cultural practices. They do some light trail maintenance, some brushing. They report some of the bigger problems to our, our full-time trail crew, such as you know a, a damaged bridge or a damaged ladder system. And they also are extremely valuable to us in getting information from hikers. A lot of cases, if we get a, a call that there's an injured hiker somewhere, one of the first things we'll do is see if there's any trail guardians in the area, and if we can get them, they can usually get there quicker than us because a lot of them are, are out on the trail already, and they can get first-hand information back to us in terms of what's going on out there. The trail crew had come along and brought them to their, to their cabin and let them camp out overnight. And they, those guys were really good with them. They told them the whole story about that site. There's, you know, lots of lo longhouses used to be there and kind of shared their, their history with them. This is where it was really, really sore the first day. It was right in here, and then it started moving down, and it was kind of... She was pretty stubborn. She didn't want to come off, but her partner was insistent. 
My biggest concern was that big fat patch of black Amazing. and blue and yeah. yellow and green yeah, that's been yeah. happening here. So there's some yeah. some type of internal bleeding going on, and that's when we decided to call quits. Was yeah. after a primary medical inspection, Shannon confirms that Kathy should be evacuated. They wrap her injured leg in an inflatable brace or vacuum splint to restrict movement. As we were leaving, uh, one of the trail crew guys had come running out of the bushes. He had uh, run up to Knit Nat Narrows to get them a crab dinner and some salmon for the road. <laughs> hey, Jeff, uh, we're just leaving uh, Squadra now. Okay, great, there's four on board. Four on board, uh, five including Jim. <laughs> and uh, what's your uh, flight path back home? We're, uh, while most people would consider a helicopter tour of the West Coast Trail an absolute delight, Kathy, unfortunately, is terrified of heights and flying. Shannon does her best to lessen her fears. After a 15-minute flight through heavy fog hanging over only the coastline, the helicopter arrives at a very sunny Port Renfrew where Jeff and BC Ambulance paramedics await. I'm good. Good. Yeah, how'd it go up there? Maybe a little... A height thing. It's, yeah. yeah as oh, long yeah. as I can cry through the whole thing, I'm okay. Uh, so I need to cry through the whole thing, so I'm yeah. good. Yeah, so we're going to come back next year. We're going to finish this thing off. We're going to do a little more strength training on the knee there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll all be good. Right on. That's our interaction with the, um, you know, the West Coast Trail user. A lot of it is these people were taken off, and it's always sorry to see them go and see their, their trip cut short. And a lot of them are off to hospital to deal with something that's uh, going to take them maybe months or who knows how long to, to heal and, and recuperate from. So they're on a long road, and it's, um, you know, we're always sorry to see them go. Friday, 8.25 a.m. Jeff Caro and Rick Holmes of the Parks Canada Rescue Station in Port Renfrew are responding to a request for help near Walbrand Creek on the West Coast Trail. 12-year-old Aisha Visser is possibly hypothermic and just three days into the challenging six-day hike with her father and teenaged brother. Just got a call from her father early this morning. He's worried about her. Uh, she's been really cold for a little while. Uh, everything she's got is wet. He says mildly hypothermic. We'll, we'll check on her uh, for that, but they're uh, otherwise, uh, sounds like she's uh, having a hard time. And there's nothing she's got that's warm. It's been raining for the last uh, couple of days. It's August, so some people just aren't prepared for it or just aren't able to manage it while they're out there. She did have a decreased uh, level of consciousness uh, for a period of time the night before where she didn't know where she was. She didn't know what day it was. So she was starting to get affected that way. And that's th those are very serious conditions and that would be something we would like to have known the night before. So a lot of times people when they come on the West Coast Trail we advise them, you know, call us when you're concerned. You know, don't don't wait too long. Make sure tell us right away if there's something that you're worried about with someone in your in your group or yourself and there's some kind of medical condition presenting itself. The run to Walbrand in these conditions will take about 40 minutes. I'm Kim, this is Jen. Jen. Okay. When maintenance and administrative chores are done, the rescue team spend a lot of time out on the trail interacting yeah. with hikers. They've been kind of trailing behind us the whole way, and yeah. we have fires at night. A lot of times when you're out there talking to people, you hear about somebody who's been struggling. Oh, there's, you know, so-and-so three days ago was struggling at this campsite. He's on his way down this way. So you, you start asking around. So on your shift, you think, well, maybe this is something we should look into and make sure he's doing all right, pay him a visit. So we can go above and beyond just responding to the calls there's lots of services we can offer in the field that will keep people on the trail instead of just us going out there and taking them off. Have a safe trip out tomorrow. Take care. Arriving at Walbrand, Rick stays with the rib just offshore as Jeff rows into the beach. She was so cold. She was shivering uncontrollably. She was constantly moving. You could see she was rubbing her legs the whole time and her arms and just didn't stop moving. Jeff immediately does a primary medical survey while her father and brother load all of the hiking equipment into the tender. It was one of those ones that when I got on scene, all I wanted to do was just, you know, wrap her up in as much warm stuff as I could and get her out of there. Aisha puts on a survival suit 
and Jeff ferries the family out to the rib for the journey back to Port Renfrew. Uh, we found that her temperature is down around 35.7. Um, she says she usually runs around 39 degrees, so it's pretty cold for her. She can't get warm. She uh, Last night spent a pretty cold night in her tent. We're transporting her to the BC Ambulance when we get back to Port Renfrew. It's about a 25 minute run home. She's come from 35.7 up to uh, 36.8 degrees, so she's, she's, in, she's in the happy zone now. And uh, she's doing better. She's got a cup of uh, a cup of Earl Grey tea at her request, and she's sipping away at that. Rick's getting the boat all ready for um, for us to turn around and get back out. And that um, that wraps that up. Good thing we brought her out, and it's a good thing her uh, her dad knew to call. While West Coast Trail rescue work can sometimes be life or death, it's mostly rescuing people in need of medical attention who can go no further. Today, the West Coast Trail has won again but that's okay. About 7,000 hikers will make it through just fine this season. And if any of them don't, you know who they're gonna call. Now, the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary is on the move. When our pager goes off, we never know what kind of a task we're going to. Sunday, 2 p.m., a twin-engine, rigid-hull inflatable boat slices through the waves in the Strait of Georgia. On board are four crew members from the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary Unit 27 Nanaimo. They're responding to a distress call from a disabled vessel in heavy seas. Huge waves generated by gale-force winds are threatening to swamp the helpless boat. But as swiftly as winds can pick up, they're just as quick to die down making the rescuer's trip smoother than expected. The 28-foot pleasure craft had broken down in the middle of the strait between Vancouver and Nanaimo, leaving its two passengers stranded in rough water for hours. Without power, the boat was pushed broadside to the large waves and rocked violently to the point of capsizing. Their urgent call for help had come at the height of the windstorm as they prepared to abandon the vessel and board small kayaks. A Canadian Coast Guard hovercraft based out of Vancouver also arrives on scene to offer assistance. And if you're comfortable towing the coral back into Confident the auxiliary crew have everything under control, the Coast Guard leave the tasking in their capable hands. The rescuers start the long trip back to Nanaimo with the powerboat in tow. If I knew it was going to get this strong this fast, I wouldn't have come out. She was looking really nasty, like right after we had our problems. This boat was looking like she was going to roll. This time, it was only a simple engine failure. But that isn't always the case. When our pager goes off, we never know uh, what, what kind of a tasking we're going to. Quite often, the rescue center will call on the radio looking for what we call a vessel of opportunity to help them out. But a lot of times, too, there's just nobody around, and that's when we are tasked to go out and assist them. Typical call-outs for this marine unit include grounded vessels, sinking ships, head-on collisions, engine fires, and people lost or missing at sea. The Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, or CCGA, is a nationwide organization whose mandate is to support the Canadian Coast Guard in marine emergencies. But unlike the Coast Guard, auxiliary units across Canada are made up entirely of volunteers, all 5,000 of them, ready to launch 24-7. Of the 56 CCGA stations in the Pacific region, Nanaimo, is one of the busiest. We have the highest number. We're averaging 95 to 100 taskings a year. We think the reason is that, that uh, we're sort of geographically positioned uh, between Vancouver and Victoria, Comox, Desolation Sound. So there's a lot of boating traffic in the Nanaimo area, and we have a lot of visitors that are unfamiliar with our waters. To meet the demand, the unit has recently added a new rescue boat to its fleet a Titan fast response vessel christened the J.C. McGregor. 
This high-performance craft is the first and only of its kind in the world, custom designed to meet Nanaimo's search and rescue needs. The specs are impressive. An enclosed cabin with enough space for three stretchers and 12 people, a top-of-the-line navigation system, infrared imaging to spot people at night, two 435 horsepower engines producing speeds up to 40 knots, and the list goes on. But its most impressive feature is this. Built to upright itself, the JC McGregor is virtually unsinkable. It took the unit four years to raise the cool half million dollars needed to acquire this ultimate rescue vessel. Well, most of our funding comes from donations from different community groups, Port Authority, the City of Nanaimo, the BC government gaming branch is a, is a great supporter. So we are a volunteer organization supported by the community. The crew gives back to its community, not only by answering emergencies, but also by patrolling public events, such as the annual bathtub race held in Nanaimo's Harbor. The auxiliary is recognized as such a vital service to the city that it is asked every year by the bathtub race to be the official starting boat. One hundred and ten kilometers south of Nanaimo, in Victoria, another community event benefits from the local Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary. Every Canada Day sees revelers taking to the water in droves. Auxiliary Unit 35, which patrols the waters around Victoria, must be ready for anything. And sure enough, a call comes in just as darkness falls. North of Victoria's downtown harbor, an unmanned vessel has been spotted drifting aimlessly and is now posing a collision hazard to other boaters. As darkness settles in, the team races off to the location. This may seem dangerous, but this crew is trained to navigate safely in all types of conditions, including zero visibility. Victoria Coast Guard Radio, Victoria Coast Guard Radio, this is Auxiliary 1A, Auxiliary 1A. This is where they come to practice advanced navigation techniques. The focus of the course is on electronic navigation. Uh, radar, chart plotter, and obviously visual components as well. So they're taking all three world views, they're matching them together, and they're navigating safely and effectively. The second focus of the course is on team leadership. So they're learning bridge resource management, um, how to positively control their crew, their craft, and the mission all at once. So you, you've identified the targets and their distance. What do you think they are? In this exercise, the crew members must come to the aid of a boat in the middle of the night. But a vessel up ahead is coming straight towards them at 20 knots. What's the collision regulations in sight here? What do you want to do? Yeah, we're going to turn to starboard. They've cross-referenced to where it might be on their chart plotter. They've turned to starboard and altered to go in behind the vessel. After they've avoided the vessel and they've assessed that there's no risk of collision, they're going to come back to their course and away they go. Located in Victoria, the RASAR is a sophisticated simulator for fast response vessels. It has two main control panels that are linked to each other. One is located inside the replica of a cockpit where the crew members train. The other is on the outside. From here, the instructor can follow the trainee's progress and give directions. That you are scraping against the rocks. We do have the auxiliary vessel out of Victoria en route. They are standing by on channel 16. Over. Roger that. The simulator mimics the controls of actual vessels in the CCGA's fleet and their movement on the water for an incredibly accurate and immersive experience. Simulator team, your instructor, congratulations. That person has been rest recovered. These subjects may be virtual, but everything else in this exercise is real. Okay, I've got it. Okay, reverse it. Yeah, get us out of here. Your exercise has been suspended by the instructor. Simulator team, instructor, congratulations. That ends the scenario. Come back to the debriefing station. Lessons learned in this risk-free environment are directly applicable to real-life scenarios. Victoria Coast 
Coast Guard Radio, Victoria Coast Guard Radio. This is Aug 35, Aug 35 on 04 Alpha, over. Back in Victoria's harbor, the Coast Guard Auxiliary Unit 35 crew has arrived at their destination. The unmanned vessel is drifting down the channel, scraping against rocks. So we're just pulling back this abandoned vessel here that he had his anchor down, but didn't quite have enough anchor road out. So it's just kind of drifting along until it bumped up against the uh, Selkirk trestle. So we're doing my favor, pull it back into some shallower water, drop the anchor again, and hopefully she'll stay this time. The team will continue to patrol the waters until the Canada Day celebrations are over and everyone has made it through the night safely. Tomorrow, other members will be on shift, ready at a moment's notice to rush out and save lives at sea. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.